everybody, it's Miss Karen, the Young Adult Librarian at the Goshen Public Library. I'm back again with a brand new box of books that we're getting ready to add to the Young Adult Collection, so I thought I'd share them with you so you can see what to look forward to. Let's open this up and see what we've got. Alright, the first one is called Accidental, and it's by Alex Richards. Looks like realistic fiction. Um, Oh, let's see what it's about. Life can change in an instant. Johanna has had more than enough trauma in her life. Her mom died in a car accident, and her father left when Johanna was just a baby. At 16, life is steady, boring, maybe even stifling, since she's being raised by her grandparents, who never talk about the past. Then he comes back, Robert Newton, Johanna's father, bringing memories and pictures of her mom, but that's not all he shares. The story Johanna has always been told is a lie. Her mom didn't die in a tragic car accident. She was shot and killed, and the truth of what really happened is more shocking than Johanna could have imagined. Now Johanna must sort through it all, but can anyone, her loyal best friends or her sweet new boyfriend, help her find a way to forgive the past? Okay, so this sounds like uh, realistic fiction, probably a little heavy, um, so if you're looking for something with some meat to the story, going to want to check out Accidental by Alex Richards. Let's see what's next. All Our Worst Ideas by Vicki Skinner. And this definitely, if you can see, looks like realistic fiction. Looks like maybe a little bit of romance. Let's see. When Amy, on her way to becoming valedictorian of her graduating class and getting accepted to her dream school, gets dumped by her long-term boyfriend, she takes a job at a record store to ease the pain. She needs a distraction, badly. Oliver, Amy's record store co-worker, isn't so sure about Amy. He's her complete opposite, but what he is sure of is his decision not to go to college. He just can't figure out how to tell his mother. As they work late night shifts at the record store, Amy and Oliver become friends and then confidants and then something more. But when Amy has a hard time letting go of what she thought was her perfect future with her ex, she risks losing the future she didn't even know she wanted with Oliver. So definitely a little bit of a light summer romance to end the summer with. Uh, if that sounds like a good choice, check out All Our Worst Ideas by Vicki Skinner. Next, we have Goddess in the Machine by Laura Beth Johnson. And this one looks like it could be science fiction. Um, yeah, I'm going to go with science fiction. Let's see. When Andrew wakes up, she's drowning. Not only that, but she's in a hot, dirty cave. It's the year 3102, and everyone keeps calling her goddess. When Andrew went into a cryonic sleep for a trip across the galaxy, she expected to wake up in a hundred years, not a thousand. Worst of all, the rest of the colonists, including her family and friends, are dead. They died centuries ago. And for some reason, their descendants think Andra, Andra's a deity. She knows she's nothing special, but she'll play along if it means she can figure out why she was left in stasis and how to get back to Earth. Zade, the exiled prince of Erinsed, has other plans. Four years ago, the sleeping goddess's glass coffin disappeared from the palace, and Zade devoted himself to finding it. Now he's hoping the goddess will be the key to taking his rightful place on the throne if he can get her to play the part, that is. Because if his people realize that she doesn't actually have the power to save their dying planet, they'll kill her. With a vicious monarch on the throne and a city tearing apart at the seams, Zade and Andra might never be able to unlock the mystery of her fate, let alone find a way to unseat the king, especially since Zade hasn't exactly been forthcoming with Andra. And a thousand years from home, is there any way of knowing that Earth is better than the planet she's woken to? So definitely science fiction, um, a little mysterious, uh, so if that is something that interests you, check out Goddess in the Machine by Laura Beth Johnson. Let's see what else we've got. Okay, this is Call Me America, American, the extraordinary true story of a young Somali immigrant, a memoir by Abdi Noor Ifton. So this is going to be nonfiction. A memoir, biography, um, and it's, uh, I 
think this is adapted from an adult book, so it's a little bit shorter than that one, but let's see what it's about. Abdi Noor Ifton grew up amidst a blend of cultures, far from the United States. At home in Somalia, his mother entertained him with vivid folk tales and bold stories detailing her rural nomadic upbringing. As he grew older, he spent his days following his father, a basketball player, through the bustling streets of the capital city of Mogadishu. When the threat of civil war reached Abdi's doorstep, his family was forced to flee to safety. Through the turbulent years of war, young Abdi found solace in popular American music and films. Nicknamed Abdi the American, he developed a proficiency for English that connected him and his story with news outlets and radio shows and eventually gave him a shot at winning the annual U.S. Visa Lottery. In this young adult edition adapted from the adult memoir, Abdi shares every part of his journey, from his experiences during the war in Somalia to his status as a refugee in Kenya to his arrival in the United States. His courageous account personalizes the politics of modern immigration and reminds readers that everyone deserves the chance to build a brighter future for themselves. So if you're looking for a true story of an immigrant who came to America, um, this is probably a great choice. It's very uplifting, upbeat, inspiring, um, and the perfect story about um, someone who came to America to follow their dreams. Okay, let's see what else we've got. Next we have The Companion by Katie Ellender. Now this one looks scary, so let's see. The other orphans say Margot is lucky. Lucky to have survived the horrible accident that killed her family. Lucky to have her own room because she wakes up screaming every night. And finally, lucky to be chosen by a prestigious family to live at their remote country estate. But it wasn't luck that made the Suttons rescue Margot from her bleak existence at the group home. Margot was handpicked to be companion to their silent, mysterious daughter, Agatha. At first, helping with Agatha and getting to know her handsome older brother seems much better than the group home. But soon, the isolated house begins playing tricks on Margot's mind, making her question everything she believes about the Suttons and herself. Margot's bad dreams may have stopped when she came to live with Agatha, but the real nightmare has just begun. So this definitely sounds like a scary read. Maybe if you're getting ready for Halloween, you want to check this one out. Um, on the back it says, Life with my new family is simple. There are rooms I don't enter, questions I don't ask, and secrets I can never tell. So, companion. All right, let's see what else we've got. The Black Kids by Christina Hammonds Reed. This looks like realistic fiction, probably very timely. Oh, it's historical, actually. Los Angeles, 1992. Ashley Bennett and her friends are living a charmed life. It's the end of senior year, and they're spending more time at the beach than in the classroom. Ashley's not always so sure she actually likes her friends these days, but they've been besties since kindergarten. Everything changes one afternoon in April when four LAPD officers are acquitted after beating a black man named Rodney King half to death. Suddenly, Ashley's not just one of the girls. She's one of the black kids. As violent protests engulf LA and the city burns, Ashley tries to continue on with life as normal. Even as her self-destructive sister gets dangerously involved in the riots, even as the model black family facade her parents have built starts to crumble, even as her best friends help spread a rumor that could completely derail the future of her classmate and fellow black kid, LaShawn Johnson. Her world, splintering around her, Ashley, along with the rest of L.A., is left to question who is the us and who is the them. So this is historical because it's set in 1992, but it's also very um, realistic as to what the country's going through right now. So the black kids might be something to read um, if you're interested in checking out something timely and historical. Right, let's see what else we've got. Uh, next we have The Faithless Hawk by Margaret Owen. Now, The Faithless Hawk is the second book in the Merciful Crow series. This is The Merciful Crow. So I am not going to tell you what The Faithless Hawk is about because I don't want to spoil anything, but I will tell you what The Merciful Crow is about so you can decide if you want to read the series. 
if you've already read The Merciful Crow, we have the second one waiting here, so you can try to check that one out. So The Merciful Crow, uh, let's see, a future chieftain, a fugitive prince, a two cunning bodyguard, and one grumpy gray tabby. B abides by one rule, look after your own. As the future chieftain of a shunned cast of mercy killers, she relies on her wits and bone magic, drawn from the teeth of dead witches to protect her band. The crows take more abuse than coin, so when they're called to collect the royal dead, Fee hopes they'll find the payout of a lifetime. When Fee discovers that Crown Prince Jezimir and his crafty bodyguard Tavin have faked their deaths to escape the ruthless Queen Rusana, she's ready to cut her losses and perhaps their throats. But Jazz offers a deal that she can't refuse. Make sure he lives to see the throne and he'll protect the crows when he reigns. To outrun and outwit the queen, the trio forge an uneasy alliance that is soon tested by old secrets, shifting allegiances, and forbidden feelings. As Rosanna and her band of deadly trackers loom ever closer, the three fugitives must discover what they're each willing to sacrifice to save their own. So that is the Merciful Crow, the first one in the series. Like I said, we just got the Faithless Hawk, the second one, which I'm not going to tell you about because I don't want to spoil the Merciful Crow. But if the if series sounds interesting to you, make sure you check it out. All right, let's see what's next. These books piled up here. Next we have The Princess Will Save You by Sarah Henning. This looks like uh, fantasy, so let's see. A fresh and feminist fantasy adventure inspired by The Princess Bride. When her father dies, Princess Amarand has is given an ultimatum, marry the leader of a neighboring kingdom or lose her crown, and possibly her life. To force her hand, her beloved, the stable boy Luca, is kidnapped. But Amarand was raised to be a warrior, not a sacrifice, and nothing will stop her from saving her true love and rescuing her kingdom. The acclaimed author of Sea Witch turns the classic damsel in distress tale on its head with this story of adventure, identity, and love. So it sounds like in this one, the princess is the one that's going to save everybody. Um, if any of you have read or watched the movie The Princess Bride, um, you might want to check this one out. The Princess Will Save You by Sarah Henning. Okay, let's see. I'm going to put this back in the box. So, what's next? Keep My Heart in San Francisco by Amelia Diane Combs. Definitely looks like romance to me. Caroline Chuck Wilson has big plans for spring break. Hit up estate sales to score vintage fashion finds and tour a fashion school she dreams of attending. But her dad wrecks those plans when he asks her to spend vacation working the counter at Big Mouth's Bowl, her family's failing bowling alley. Making things astronomically worse, Chuck finds out her dad is way behind on back rent, meaning they might be losing Big Mouth's, the only thing keeping Chuck's family in San Francisco. And the one person other than Chuck who wants to do anything about it? Beckett Porter, her annoyingly attractive ex-best friend. So when Beckett propositions Chuck with a plan to hustle bowlers for cash around the Bay Area, she accepts. But she can't shake the nagging feeling that she's acting reckless, too much like her mother for comfort. Plus, despite her best efforts to keep things strictly business, Beckett's charm is winning her back over in ways that go beyond friendship. If Chuck fails, Big Mouth's bowl and their San Francisco legacy are gone forever. But if she succeeds, she might just get everything she ever wanted. This is definitely a romance, realistic. Sounds like it's uh, enemies to um, friends to boyfriend, girlfriend storyline. So if that's something that you really enjoy, check out Keep My Heart in San Francisco by Amelia Diane Combs. We have next. We have All Eyes on Her by L. E. Flynn, and this one looks suspenseful. Maybe it's got kind of a graphic cover there with the face staring back at you, maybe a little dark. You heard the story on the news. A girl and boy went into the woods. The girl carried a picnic basket. The boy wore bright yellow running shoes. The girl found her way out, but the boy never did. Everyone thinks they know what happened. Some say Tabby pushed him off that cliff. 
She didn't even like hiking. She was jealous. She had more than her share of demons. Others think he fell accidentally. She loved Mark. She would never hurt him, even if he'd hurt her. But what's the real story? All eyes on her is told from the perspective of everyone but Tabby herself, as the people in her life string together the events that led Tabby to that cliff. Her best friend, her sister, her enemy, her ex-boyfriend, because everybody thinks they know a girl better than she knows herself. What do you think is the truth? So this is definitely suspense. To figure out if Tabby pushed him off the cliff or if he fell off the cliff um, without actually hearing it from Tabby herself. So this sounds like a really good suspenseful book to check out. Okay, let's see what else we have. Next we have Igniting Darkness by Robin Lefevers. And this is the second book after Courting Darkness, which I'm going to show you, which is part of the My Fair Assassin series. Um, well, it's a companion to the My Fair Assassin series. So if you've read the My Fair Assassin books, um, you might want to check out Courting Darkness, which is sort of separate, but it has some of the same characters. Um, and then Igniting um, Igniting Darkness is the second one. So I will tell you about Courting Darkness um, because I don't want to spoil it. So this is definitely fantasy. Um, it's historical fantasy, too. Okay, so Sabella has always been the darkest of death's daughters, trained at the convent of St. Mortain to serve as his justice. But she has a new mission now. In a desperate bid to keep her two younger sisters safe from the family that nearly destroyed them all, she agrees to accompany the Duchess to France, where they quickly find themselves surrounded by enemies. Their one ray of hope is Sabella's fellow novitiates, disguised and hidden deep in the French court years ago by the convent, provided Sabella can find them. Genevieve has been undercover for so many years, she struggles to remember who she is or what she's supposed to be fighting for. Her only solace is a hidden prisoner who appears all but forgotten by his guards. When tragedy strikes, she has no choice but to take matters into her own hands, even if it means ignoring the long-awaited orders from the convent. As Sabella's and Jen's paths draw ever closer, their worlds threaten to collide, causing the fate of everything they hold sacred to rest on a knife's edge. So this is historical fantasy. Um, really good world building in this series. Uh, if you have read the My Fair Assassin books, um, you're going to want to check out um, Courting Darkness and the newest one, Igniting Darkness. Um, if you haven't read them, you can still read Courting Darkness and Igniting Darkness, but you might want to check them out because they're, um, they give really good backstory. Um, so, but if you've read all of them and you want uh, the next one, we have it, Igniting Darkness. Okay. All right, we've got two more books left, so let's see. This one is Girl Unframed by Deb Coletti, and it looks like realistic fiction. Uh, Sydney Riley has a bad feeling about going home to San Francisco even before she gets on the plane. How could she not? Her mother is Lila Shore, the Lila Shore, a film star who prizes her beauty and male attention above all else, certainly above her daughter. But Sydney's worries multiply when she discovers that Lila is involved with a dangerous Jake an art dealer with shady connections. Jake loves all beautiful objects, and Sydney can feel his eyes on her whenever he's around. And he's not the only one. Sydney is starting to attract attention, good and bad, wherever she goes. From sweet, handsome Nico Ricci, from the unsettling construction worker next door, and even from Lila. Behaviors that once seemed like misunderstandings begin to feel like threats as the summer grows longer and hotter. It's unnerving how beauty is complicated and objects have histories, and you can be looked at without ever being seen. But real danger, crimes of passion, the kind of stuff where someone gets killed, it only mostly happens in the movies, Sydney is sure. Until the night that something life-changing happens on the stairs that lead to the beach. A thrilling night that goes suddenly very wrong. When loyalties are called into question and when Sydney learns a terrible truth, beautiful objects can break. So this sounds like a realistic fiction with maybe a little bit of a thriller aspect to it. Um, it's 
sounds interesting. Another San Francisco book, the second one we've had so far. So check out uh, Girl Unframed by Deb Coletti. And the last book in my box, it's a heavy one, it's called Cursed, and it is based on the Netflix, original Netflix TV series. Um, it's written by Thomas Wheeler, illustrated by Frank Miller. Looks like a King Arthur kind of a book, and it is very heavy, and it's got illustrations inside, really cool ones like that. Let's see. Discover the epic adventure that inspired the new Netflix series. The time for kings is over. The sword has chosen a queen. Nimue grew up an outcast. Her connection to dark magic made her something to be feared in her druid village, and that made her desperate to leave. That is, until red paladins slaughter her entire village, and her fate is forever altered. Charged by her dying mother to reunite an ancient sword with a legendary sorcerer, Nimu is now her people's only hope. Her mission leaves little room for revenge, but the growing power within her can think of nothing else. She teams up with a charming mercenary named Arthur and refugee fey folk. She wields a sword meant for the one true king. She battles to unite her people, avenge her family, and discover the truth about her destiny. And perhaps the one thing that can change destiny itself is found at the edge of a blade. So this book has some illustrations in it. Like that. It's not technically a graphic novel because it's mostly print, but it does have some great illustrations to go along with the story. So if you like the Netflix series, or you're interested in King Arthur, or all of the above, you're going to want to check out Cursed by Thomas Wheeler, illustrated by Frank Miller. So that is all that I have for you today. If any of these books sound good to you, make sure you look for them in the catalog or give me a call to put them on hold. You can come in and see us now anytime. Um, we're almost back to our normal hours, so uh, wear your mask and come in and browse for books like these. Thanks, guys.